further ado, I'm going to hit record and we'll turn it over to you, Megan. Thank you so much, Blake. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Excellent. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really enjoy having these opportunities to step back and collect my thoughts and reflections on my life. And um, this has been one of those opportunities where I got to sit down and, and really articulate my thoughts on faith in science and, and my journey. And so the way that I'm going to structure this talk is I'll give a brief introduction to myself, which actually, Blake, you've covered really nicely. Um, so so as Blake mentioned, I did my undergraduate degree and my master's degree in Edmonton, where I was born. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to win a Rhodes Scholarship and I moved to England. And um, the, sort of the, the bookend of my experience in England was having my, my daughter, Laurelyn. This is me in my what's called subfusk, which is um, a special outfit that you have to wear at Oxford when you defend your thesis. And so I had to get special maternity subfusk. And my daughter was born, you know, days, just mere days after I managed to finish the degree. Um, just a quick question. Can you see my mouse moving around the screen? Um, let's see. I see my mouse. Let's see. I'm going to move mine off so I don't get it mixed up. Um, I can see glimpses of it here and there. Glimpses of it here and there. Okay. Yeah, but it's, I, it's good. Otherwise I'm just seeing the photo itself. Uh, maybe I'll try it with a spotlight. Um, did you want us to see the mouse? Yeah. I just want to be able to point things out on the slides. Okay. So let me just see if I can get, I should be able to actually do this on Zoom. There should be a laser feature. So let me just see, I'll take five seconds and see if I can get it to work. Oh, no and worries. if I can't, then. Um, this is all the, the fun of new technology. I'm see, yeah, oh, there we go. Okay, so do you see that? Oh, there we go, yes, I can see the little red dot there. Perfect, okay, excellent. Beautiful. Okay, and so, so yes, yeah, so I finished up in Oxford and then um, took maternity leave with my daughter, Laurelyn. And this is a family, a recent family photo. Um, these are my kids, Laurelyn and Francis. My husband, Mitch, we're living in Cambridge. Um, yeah, so it's wonderful to meet you and thank you so much for having me today. The outline of my talk is as follows. So I'm going to try and weave together some of my more, some of my reflections on the nature of the faith science intersection with my story. So how I came to have those those reflections and those thoughts. So it's going to be part narrative, um, part philosophical treatise. So I hope that's okay. So I'm going to start with faith. Um, then I'm going to talk about my science. And then I'm going to talk about how they intersect. Then I'm going to give um, a few caveats. And now if I had actually given this talk back when Blake first contacted me to give this talk, I might not have had this, this fourth section. Um, so I'm really actually grateful to be here today to be able to speak to that because I think it's really important. And I'm finally going to close with some of my thoughts on mission and how all of these things inform, um, inform my mission. So faith, kind of the foundational element here in my, my flow chart. So I, I was a cradle Catholic, um, and I'm going to pop up a picture here of probably the most important person, um, you know, aside from God, the Father, Christ, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Um, the most important person in my faith formation was my, my grandfather. And so his name is Bernard Roth and he's seen here in his workshop. And he spent you know hundreds and hundreds of hours of his retirement crafting these beautiful creches. Um, so nativity scenes, and he would give them away to schools and churches. And it basically, he, he built Bethlehem everywhere. And um, the experience of watching him live his life, he was, he was very humble very grateful. I could tell you dozens of stories about how he allowed his life to be a reflection of Christ's love. And there's a really lovely St. Francis of Assisi quote, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. And I always think of my grandpa Roth when I hear that quote, because he, I don't remember ever having a conversation with him explicitly about faith. And yet, I found as I came into young adulthood, there were certain tenets that I just knew in my bones. And when I interrogated why, it was because I had seen the fruit of a life lived with, within the catechism. Right? I'd, I'd seen the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces in the person of my grandfather. So there was a really deep faith that sort of took root in me at a very young age. Um, and I think it, it informs Kind of the the whole rest of my story the whole rest of the discussion is this foundational faith um and i really love this quote from c.s lewis 
I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. And I think this really encapsulates um, for me how Christianity is the fundamental framework or the fundamental lens through which I'm viewing the world. So I'm just gonna give you a disclaimer in this talk. I'm coming from a, a Catholic Christian worldview. I was formed in that worldview. So everything else is gonna distill from that. So now let's talk about um, science. So how does science come into my life and my picture? So first, first we had this foundation of faith. Um, and then as I, as I grew into adulthood, I developed an interest in science. And I had the privilege of working in various different research environments. So I'm just going to give you a brief whirlwind tour of the, the scientific research experiences that I've had. So my very first research experience was with lasers, as was intimated in the title of this talk. Um, the first thing I got to do in a lab ever was play with lasers, very, very powerful lasers. And in fact, um, this was where I learned that I probably shouldn't be an experimental scientist. So I <laughs> had the unfortunate experience of burning my hair in the laser beam once because I had very, very long hair and I was leaning over these, these um, these items that you're seeing here in the picture are lenses. So this is a typical optic setup in a laser lab. And what, what opticians do is arrange these lenses and to guide the laser along a certain path, the path that, that we wanted to go for whatever research purpose. And so at one point I actually was leaning over a lens and trying to focus the laser beam and my hair um, started to, to smoke and sizzle. And so I realized maybe the lab wasn't the place for me. So I moved into um, more theoretical research and I had the incredible opportunity of studying what's called an X-ray binary. So here I'm showing a picture of an X-ray binary system. So binary because there are two members of the system. One is a normal star, rather like our sun, just a normal star living its life. And the other is a vampiric, um, very, very dense object, either a black hole or a neutron star. And a neutron star is a name for basically just a very small, very heavy um, remnant from a star that's, that's exploded, that's gone supernova. And what happens in these systems is this tiny, heavy object pulls matter off of the, the donor star and releases huge amounts of energy um, as x-rays. And so I spent a lot of time analyzing the x-ray signals of these, um, these systems to learn about them. I then actually returned to the lab briefly to, to work with something called optical tweezers, which are, so what you're looking at here, these red things are laser beams and they're focused to a point. So you can see how they kind of come in and they focus to a small point. And in this focus region, there's um, what's a, this blue bead it's a glass bead. So there's two glass beads in two laser beams. And these beads are held in the, the, the focus of the laser due to um, a complex interplay of forces that basically traps them at the focal point. And what you can do is actually suspend molecules between these two beads and you can move the lasers apart. So I actually at one point had kind of like a joystick scenario and I was moving these lasers back and forth back and forth to to prod and poke single molecules of DNA. Um, so this was a really really cool experience that I had as well and from that I moved again left the laboratory and did some more theoretical research on DNA molecules um, more generally. So right here you can see uh, a DNA, a piece of a DNA helix. Now DNA is kind of the fundamental currency of life. In our DNA uh, contains the instructions for everything about us and actually everything about all living matter. So I studied the, the mechanics and the physics of DNA, the forces that are binding the, the different um, genes together um, and the biophysics of those molecules using computer simulations. And then from that, I sort of used that computational experience to as, as a uh, platform to move into machine learning, which is where I'm where I am right now. So right now, what I'm doing is trying to learn about machine learning, um, which is this very broad field that refers to kind of teaching machines um, about 
data in the real world. So it could be a Netflix algorithm learning the types of shows that you like. But those same tools that are used to train your Netflix algorithm can actually be really, really useful in physics and in biophysics. So what I'm trying to do is build a bridge from machine learning and those techniques that have been developed in the con context of companies like Google and Amazon. And I'm trying to borrow those and put them into academic physics. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. So now that's sort of a whirlwind tour of my science. And um, I hope I've given the impression that I've been, I've been very grateful to be able to be exposed to many different scientific disciplines in my research career. And so now I wanna talk about how those things intersect. I came from this place of deep faith. I was exposed to some really incredible cutting edge research um, at the University of Alberta and the University of Oxford and Harvard. And so how do those things intersect basically for me? And now I wanna give some vignettes about my life and the experiences that I've had that kind of inform my thinking on this topic. So we'll start at the University of Alberta when I was a young undergraduate student, um, naive, fresh faced, and kind of walking from class to class. I had physics, I had astronomy, I had maths classes. And I remember in one particular astrophysics class, um, overhearing one of, so I was actually, I took this class kind of one semester early. So I was with a, a bunch of kind of more senior students who were one year ahead of me in the astrophysics program. And I remember hearing one of them talking to the professor after class and saying, oh, isn't it so stupid to believe in God? Can you believe that people still have this archaic idea that God exists? And I had never really, I'd gone to Catholic high school, Catholic elementary, I'd never heard that sort of disdain for religious belief before. But unfortunately, it was to become sort of the new normal of my experience at the University of Alberta. This was sort of my first experience at a secular educational institution. And I was shocked by um, how differently people viewed faith to how I viewed it. So I remember another time, one of my classmates noticing um, that I had a cross necklace and kind of feeling sheepish because he had just spent half an hour talking about how stupid it was to be religious and how silly that was and how medieval. Um, so I, I encountered this quite a lot from my classmates, this idea that you know somehow faith and science don't mix. Another vignette that I wanna present is a moment that I had in my final year of my undergraduate degree in a general relativity class. And general relativity is the theory that describes um, gravity and how gravity works. And um, some of you may have seen this photo. It's a very famous image from just, I think last year or the year before, and it's our first high resolution picture of a black hole. And you may not think it looks like much, but I mean, it's kind of surprising it looks like anything, right? Because it's a black hole. But what you can see is a ring of light around the black hole. And I remember learning about black holes in my general relativity class and having kind of an epiphany, a moment of um, a, a sort of deep realization that there was a really deep philosophical dimension to some of the science I was learning. My professor was talking about how what happens in a black hole is you have light that sort of orbiting around it and slowly getting drawn into the gravitational well of the black hole. But once light uh, passes what's called the event horizon, it can never ever come back out and you can never send any information out of that horizon. So you can basically never communicate what the experience of crossing that threshold is like. And it occurred to me that that was just like death, right? You can't, no matter, even though so many billions of people have gone through it, you can never communicate that. Information can never pass back through that event horizon. And I'm sort of sitting there in my GR class, you know, missing the, the rest of the derivation because I'm thinking, wow, like that's, that's really profound. God is the author of this incredible universe where these truths are accessible philosophically and also scientifically and sometimes both at the same time. So the third formative experience I want to share with you in my development of kind of faith science philosophy is reading the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, which I really can't recommend enough. And this was sort of coming at the tail end of my undergraduate degree. I was in my master's degree and I'd had these two kind of experiences, one of people critiquing faith in the light of science like my classmates and peers sort of thinking it was stupid to be religious. And this other experience of a deep sense of wonder in learning about the science and connecting it to theology and philosophy. And I, I sort of didn't know how to marry these things together. And then I read Mere Christianity and I remember finishing it 
it was, it just changed my life. And I was finishing it on a plane, a really small airplane where there's one seat at the front. I don't know if you've ever been on an airplane like this, but there's one seat at the front that faces everybody else in the plane. And I'm in that seat. And I've chosen this moment to finish mere Christianity, which brought me completely to tears. So I'm sobbing on this airplane, finishing this book, you know, because it's really clicked things into place in my soul. And everyone on the plane must have just thought, what's going on? Why, what is she doing? What's going on? And why I was crying is because I realized that my faith was reasonable and I didn't have to be sort of siloed into scientist and, you know, Catholic who loves my grandpa. It was, it was, um, they were sort of seamlessly entwined in God's creation. And I realized that the Christian faith is fundamentally rational, fundamentally reasonable. And there's this really beautiful quote um, from mere Christianity that humans became scientific because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in a lawgiver. So not only was Christianity reasonable, but the whole edifice of modern science was actually able to develop because there was a Christian climate in which sort of the movers and shakers in society believed that the universe would be comprehensible. So they were patrons of the sciences. So the church was actually a great patron of science and sort of realizing this really clicked things into place for me. It was very transformational. So now I wanna just read a couple of quotes from Genesis that um, communicate how, how I see faith and science interacting. So now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. And so for me, this is describing the scientific endeavor. God created this incredible universe and it is our inheritance to name it. I mean, in biology, that's literally what's happening. Biology is a science very much of classification, you know, naming things, taxonomies. But in, in a, you know, even in the other sciences, kind of what you're doing symbolically is naming the universe. We're looking at photons. We're looking at black holes and we are naming them. That's a quasar. That's an X-ray binary system. And we're, we're understanding them. We're trying to comprehend these creatures and these phenomena that God has made. Um, and then a related quote here, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So here again, I think we see that we have been given a mind in the image of God that is able to delight in the creation because precisely because we can begin to probe it and understand the underlying laws. And I think, you know, fundamentally, this is, you know, at a deep level, this allows us to become closer to God because we are getting to know, we are getting to know God through our scientific inquiry. And what I mean by that, um, I can try and illustrate with this quote, um, from C.S. Lewis, also from Mere Christianity. Um, so I'm going to read a longer version of the quote than I put up here. Everything God has made has some likeness to himself. Space is like him in its hugeness. Matter is like God in having energy. The intense activity and fertility of the insects, for example, is a first dim resemblance to the unceasing activity and the creativeness of God. In the higher mammals, we get the beginnings of instinctive affection. That's not the same thing as the love that exists in God, but it is like it, rather in the way that a picture drawn on a flat piece of paper can nevertheless be like a landscape. So we're learning about God because his creation bears the fingerprints of him. So when I'm learning about quantum mechanics and the deep mystery of it, in some way I am falling in love with God, as you would fall in love with a person, as you get to know them, you get to know their likes and dislikes, you get to know their sense of humor, you begin to delight in their uniqueness. That's what I'm doing when I'm doing scientific research. I'm learning about God and I'm seeing his sense of humor and I'm seeing his brilliance as I learn these physics laws that govern his creation. And I think he delights in that. I think he delights in us learning about him in that way. Um, and so I'm also going to draw here, just to close this section, from the catechism, the Catholic catechism, 
Um, so with creation, God does not abandon his creatures to themselves. He not only gives them being in existence, but also at every moment upholds and sustains them in being, enables them to act and brings them to their final end. And what I take from this is that God didn't just make the universe, program the laws of physics and peace out. God is every moment sustaining creation, every moment creating a new all of creation. And so he's present intimately in the continual functioning of the laws of statistical mechanics. And so in learning those laws and in, you know, probing things with the laser tweezers, I'm actually interacting with God in the present moment as he continues to create those things and sustain those laws. So it's getting to fall in love with God scientific study to me. So now we can kind of return to what I talked about as my scientific experiences. And this is where I've come to appreciate the science that I'm doing. I've come to, to see God in, in the brilliance of the genetic code that he's created, in the majesty of the X-ray binary systems that are at this moment sort of violently whirling around in space and holding all these things in tension, the very, very large scales of science that I've explored. And then the very, very micro scales, the nanoscopic scales of science that are, you know, just now opening up new horizons in technology that, that we're, you know, we're using DNA now to make artificial machines that can help with drug delivery and cancer treatments. So learning about how manipulation on that nanoscale can be done and also appreciating the vastness of God's creation has really deepened my faith. Um, so that intersection has been super foundational for me. And now another vignette from my story, um, I kind of used this, this profound sense of falling in love with God through science. Um, as the motivation for my application essay to the Rhodes Scholarship. The whole essay was kind of predicated on, you know, science and faith. And in a way, I think my success was partly because this was a strange narrative for people to hear. They weren't used to a scientist openly proclaiming her faith. And so here's one of the, the news articles that came out after I'd won the scholarship. And in, in all of the news interviews, I talked about my belief in God driving my scientific discovery, both from a desire to serve and from a desire to know God intimately. Um, and so some of the articles actually kept that in and, and found it. I, I got the sense that a lot of people found it sort of an oddity. Um, in my Rhodes interview, people picked up on that thread in my essay and asked me, you know, well, how can you believe in free will? and an omniscient God at the same time. So my Rhodes interview was largely me sort of defending and elaborating on how I integrated my, my faith and my science. And I got the sense that, you know, people think this is strange. And when I arrived at Oxford, so this is a, this is a picture of Rhodes House, which is um, basically serves as the headquarters for the Rhodes Scholars in Oxford. And so there's a warden of Rhodes House who kind of manages the Rhodes Scholarships and hosts events, yada, yada, yada. When I first got there, we had our kind of initial meeting with the warden. We had one-on-one -on -one meetings with the warden, kind of get to know you. Um, and I remember he was, he saw what I, what I was taking and I was reading for a PhD in physics. And so he said, oh, you know, you've really got to go see Richard Dawkins speak. And for those of you who haven't heard of him, Richard Dawkins is a very prominent evolutionary biologist, but also very strong atheist, very, very um, disdainful of religion, you know, sort of violently against religion. And um, the warden said, you know, you should go see him speak. I bet you love him. And I kind of wanted to communicate politely that I didn't think I'd have a lot in common with this man. So I said, well, I'd like to go speak just to hear his point of view, but I don't think we'd have a lot in common. And sort of the warden picked up on the fact that I was suggesting that I wasn't um, antipathetic to religion, that I actually might be religious. And the warden said, oh, I forgot about your prairie upbringing. And I couldn't believe that I was just sort of being typecast as, you know, because I'm from the prairie, I, there were just so many things wrong with this interaction. And it really took me off guard. And it made me think, you know, people aren't expecting a physicist to be religious. Why is that? What's going on here? Because for me, 
I didn't see a conflict between faith and science. And so I kind of looked into where this idea came from that, that faith and science are somehow in discord. Um, and it's actually a relatively recent invention in the right around the enlightenment era in the 18th or the 19th century, I think it was, there were a couple of authors who wrote some, some really influential books kind of proposing that the Bible was unscientific. But if you look at the, the tradition of our Holy Fathers and the Popes, um, they've never found this conflict to be an issue. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, the church has been a huge patron of the sciences. Um, so here's a quote from Pope Paul VI. Science never truly conflicts with faith for earthly matters and the concerns of faith derive from the same God. Indeed, whoever labors to penetrate the secrets of reality with a humble and steady mind, even though he is unaware of the fact, is nevertheless being led by the hand of God, who holds all things in existence and gives them their identity. So here we have a Pope very clearly affirming that science and faith are not in conflict. And then I, I know that a lot of the, the conflict kind of stems from the clash of creationist doctrine, so kind of anti-evolution theory doctrine with, um, with the theory of evolution in science. But again, when I turn, turn to the, the example of our popes, we've had popes who've affirmed that evolution is an effectively proven fact. And St. John Henry Newman, who um, was you know, one of the greatest theologians in our tradition, I see nothing in the theory of evolution inconsistent with an almighty creator and protector. And so this, this sort of manufactured conflict be between Christianity and science, I guess more specifically between Catholicism and science, um, it's just that, it's, just man it's a manufactured conflict that isn't fundamentally there in the catechism and in the scriptures and in the tradition of our church fathers. Um, and, and again, as I was saying before, the study of science gives me an appreciation for God. I think evolutionary theory as well deepens my appreciation for God because the way that he brought about life is so much more complex and so much more intricate than something that we could have imagined. And so the study of that, I think, is, is a beautiful complement to faith. Um, so now I just want to give some heroes of faith and science because I acknowledge that this is a very widespread um, misconception that, that faith and science are at odds. So I want to give some heroes of faith and science. Hildegard of Bingen is one of my favorites. Actually, my daughter's middle name is Hildegard. So Hildegard is basically um, well, a huge polymath, but she was kind of a medical doctor, kind of one of the first people to write a medical treatise. So she wrote a lot about plants, animals, and trees, and their medicinal uses. Um, so she also talks about, you know, how she writes a, a bunch about botany. She, she, yeah, so uh, yeah, she's one of the very, very first people who actually wrote down um, medical writing like her, her writing is studied in a lot of medical science degrees because she's one of the first people that wrote this stuff down and at the same time she's a great doctor of the church a saint in the church she had mystical visions she wrote tons of symphonic works praising god like she's a very holy woman she was an abbess um, but also one of the first medical scientists uh, next is father gregor mendel who is the father of genetics so all of i mean you could say almost all of modern medicine um, owes a debt to this man who was a Catholic priest, an Austrian and a Catholic priest who did experiments with pea plants in the 19th century and learned about genetic inheritance. So he sort of founded this field of genetics on which so much modern medicine relies. Sister Mary Kenneth Keller was the first, was a nun, clearly, and the uh, Catholic nun and the first person, not just first woman, but the first person to get a computer science PhD um, in the United States. And Father George Lemaitre is actually one of my favorites. He's a Catholic priest and actually the person who came up with the Big Bang Theory. So we, so you may have heard this theory that the universe started um, as an infinitesimally small bit that exploded into all the matter that we have today. Well, the author of that theory was a Catholic priest. And um, he, he was the very first person to predict the way that the universe, uh, the rate of the universe expansion that we use today. Um, and so, so he's the author of the Big Bang Theory, and he, he actually knew Einstein as well. So I hope that I've given a case for why faith and science can be fruitfully integrated and um, given you some, some examples of people who have integrated it very successfully in their own lives and careers. 
Now I want to talk about um, a couple of caveats. And as I said earlier, this is sort of a newer addition to my story, um, born of the reflection of the last few years. And to illustrate it, I want to give you another vignette from my, my personal story. And that is when I got to Oxford, um, I was really excited to be sent an invitation to a somewhat secretive society called the Oxford Forum on Science and Religion. And the reason I got this invitation was actually because I had been so open about my faith in all of the media coverage after I won the Rhodes Scholarship. One of the professors at U of A, um, Professor Don Page, who's also a devout Christian and a physicist, he's a award winning, he was actually the graduate student of Stephen Hawking, if you've heard of Stephen Hawking. So he's a super famous theoretical physicist, also a believer. And he sent me a private message saying, oh, I didn't know you were a believer. I just saw the article. I'm going to get you in touch with this guy at Oxford. And this guy at Oxford sent me this invitation to this society called the Oxford Forum on Science and Religion. And this picture here, this painting, it's basically exactly what this forum was. It was a bunch of older gentlemen sitting in what's called a senior common room where all the Oxford professors kind of dine and smoke cigars after dinner. Um, there were no cigars actually in, in this modern era, but basically that's the atmosphere that it had. And I was based, I was, I think the only woman occasionally, um, one of the professor's wives would attend, but I was certainly the youngest member and often the only female member in this sort of this sort of dark cloying atmosphere. And what would happen was it was a bunch of professors from across theology and science departments that were Christian and they would get together and present a paper on faith and science. And we would spend the evening kind of discussing it. And there were some really big names. I remember feeling completely overawed to be in the presence of these men because there were some huge players in faith and science. Alistair McGrath, who is a really, really famous author, who's like a C.S. Lewis biographer. Um, Richard Swinburne, also very, very famous science faith apologist. And these guys were presenting papers and I was there being asked to comment. And for most of my visits to the Oxford Forum, I was too overawed to say anything. Um, yeah, I was, I was kind of too overawed to speak, but I loved it. And I was drinking it in and I thought, this is it. This is the stuff of dreams, science and faith together at last. But then I sort of had a realization towards the end of my tenure at Oxford, I went to one of the talks and it was trying to explain miracles, um, which, which they called in very technical language, special divine action. Um, and it was trying to explain how that was consistent with quantum theory and how quantum mechanics could kind of allow those things to, to happen. And it just, I can't quite narrow down the exact phrase or the exact moment that I had that triggered this thought. But I remember feeling after I left the talk that this wasn't quite right, that something was lost. We were losing the plot a little bit here in writing these long treatises, trying to explain specifically how elements of theology or elements of God's creation were specifically related to different scientific laws or allowed by different scientific theories. And so now I wanna present a couple of quotes here from um, firstly, Pope Pius XII, secondly, from George Lemaitre, our friend of the Bing Bang Theory. So Pope Pius in the 50s opened a meeting of the Pontifical Academy of Science by basically talking about the Big Bang Theory that George Lemaitre had, had just come up with and sort of claiming it for Catholicism as a victory and saying, look, this proves what we've been saying about God, because look at the creation story in Genesis. There was nothing, then there was something. Look at Father George Lemaitre's theory. There was nothing, and then there was a bang, and there was something. Ergo, we are right. And it was sort of this triumphant speech saying, science is now proving the Bible. And George Lemaitre was mortified about this. He said, this has totally lost the plot because, and I think he's, he's correctly perceived that marrying science too closely to theology could hugely backfire because we don't know what the author of creation has written in science. And, you know, back at the beginning of the development of Christian doctrine, St. Augustine in the fourth century, he noticed that the Bible wasn't literal in the old, sorry, I, I should say specifically, he noticed that Genesis wasn't literal because days, he knew about the rotation of the earth and he knew that where it was morning in one place, it was evening in a different place. So he knew about that basic science science and astronomy, and he connected it to Genesis and St. Augustine back in the fourth century said, oh, Genesis isn't literal, guys. And so Pope Pius is kind of back, kind of uh, 
back swimming here and saying, well, actually science does prove the Bible is right. And George Lemaitre, right, he, he rightly realized that there was a great danger in this. And also it's sort of this impoverished both of the fields. So here's a, a couple of really beautiful quotes from Father George Lemaitre. So in the background here, you see the text of an article from the New York Times. He's meeting with Einstein and this, this article was called Lemaitre follows two paths to truth. So even, and this was from 1933. So people have been really shocked about religious scientists for a long time. And in this article, he has two really brilliant points. He says, we should keep the middle ground between two extremes. One is considering science and religion completely disconnected compartments. But the other is rashly and irreverently mixing and confusing what must remain separate. Once you realize that the Bible does not purport to be a textbook of science, the old controversy between religion and science vanishes. So he's basically saying, you know, keep these things in their proper places, allow them to interact and have a beautiful dynamism, but don't try and rewrite the Bible with science and vice versa. And here's another quote that I want to end this section on um, from St. John Paul II, this beautiful letter that he wrote to the Vatican, director of the Vatican Observatory. And I think he's, he puts it much better than I could. I keep using quotes because I feel like these, these people have put it a lot better than I could. So the unity that we seek is not identity. The church does not propose that science should become religion or religion science. On the contrary, unity always presupposes the diversity and integrity of its elements. We are asked to become one. We are not asked to become each other. And so this is where I think that the meetings of the Oxford Forum lost the plot a little bit because writing a paper that tries to explain miracles with quantum physics sort of misses the beauty that you get if you allow both of those things to be distinct ways of knowing God. We can learn about God's mind through quantum physics and we learn about him through revelation, but we need both. They can't supplant each other and they are not the same thing. So I realize I'm at 40 minutes now um, or just about. So I wanna close with, with some thoughts on mission. Um, so your conference brief, for this 2020 conference asks the question, are Catholic hospitals and care homes indistinguishable from their public partners? And I wanna tell you about one final vignette in my story in an attempt to give you a few of my thoughts on this question. Um, so this is a more recent story from last February. Um, as, as a Schmidt Science Fellow, a postdoctoral fellow, I've had the privilege of going to a few different what are called global meetings, where it's essentially a conference and all of the Schmidt Science Fellows from my cohort gather for a week and get to meet a bunch of, you know, scientific and political um, luminaries and hear them speak. It's, it's really incredible. And so the, the meeting that we went to in February 2020, we got to meet a woman named Jennifer Dudna. And she's here on, on the left. And she actually won the Nobel Prize just a few months after we, we heard her speak at this engagement. And um, she, she won the Nobel Prize for inventing something called CRISPR, which you might have heard of. It's an incredible technology that allows scientists to edit genes in situ. And what this means is you can conceivably think about removing um, oncogenes or cancer causing genes from um, fetuses. You could think about trying to correct for genetic um, illnesses, you know, in the womb by editing genes. There's huge, and, and actually some scientists have already tried to do that. Um, and so, so there's obviously huge ethical implications for this technology. And I asked her, I asked her, do you ever feel like someone from the Manhattan Project? And now the Manhattan Project was um, the group of scientists who developed the atomic bomb during the Second World War. And a lot of them spoke kind of remorsefully in years afterward because they were quantum physicists. Um, and obviously their science was turned to a very destructive purpose and there are ethical questions surrounding that. And so I said to Jennifer, like, do you ever feel, you know, similar sort of reservations? And she said, you know, I never really thought about ethics. I remember having to take an ethics seminar as a graduate student, but I just sort of sat at the back and thought this doesn't apply to me. And I was really, kind of shocked and dismayed by that answer because it's super, super important as a scientist to be cognizant of the ethical implications of your work. And just a few examples, I've mentioned the atomic bomb, now gene editing with CRISPR. You know, um, there are medical issues like abortion, abortion and euthanasia. There are issues surrounding artificial intelligence when 
when and if that becomes sentient, what sort of rights would art artificial intelligent beings have? So there's a lot of ethical questions that, that surround scientific and medical research. And I think that scientists need to be serving God in holiness and they need to be animated by love. And so I, I realize I'm rambling. I'm going to try and tie all the threads together here by talking about the very, very beginnings of Christianity and Catholicism. So um, going back to the foundation of Christianity in the climate of the ancient world in which it evolved, um, I'm going to I'm going to quote a little bit from a book called Dominion, which I really love. It's written by a historian, Tom Holland, who is not a Christian but whose entire thesis is that our whole world has been shaped by Christianity, by Christian ethics, by Christian morals. And even in the secular society in which we live, the imprint of the Christianity is so deep that most people don't even realize that it's Christianity that they're invoking. And so if you go back to the very beginnings of Christianity, um, in the ancient world, there wasn't this idea that every human life had inherent dignity and was lovable and loved by the creator. That didn't exist. So you routinely had the sick being exiled. You had babies being abandoned by the road. Um, and then along came Christians. And here's a quote from the book. There was no human existence so wretched, none so despised or vulnerable that it did not bear witness to the image of God. Divine love for the outcast and derelict demanded that mortals love them too. And the, the natural conclusion of this philosophy that the Christians had through revelation, through Christ on the cross, was that we must care for the sick. And so here is pictured St. Basil the Great, who founded the very first hospital in the fourth century. And he was animated by revealed truth that all humans are made in the image of God and are afforded basic dignity. Um, and so he started the ministry of hospitals. And so, I am now going to try and connect the feds, threads together. We have science and there's a lot of ethical um, morass in science. And I believe that as a scientist and a Christian, we need Christianity in science because we need to be governed by ethics and morals and concern for the dignity of each person in the science that we do. And similarly, you are all in a healthcare setting. And if we go back to the foundation of Christianity, hospitals evolved because of this, this Christian animus. And so the difference, I think, between Catholic hospitals and care homes and their public partners is that the secular institutions have become unmoored from the very truth that instigated them. They exist because of Christianity. In the ancient world, you didn't have hospitals. It is a Christian conviction that causes us to want to care for the poor, to see the dignity in the dying, to see the dignity in babies and the unborn. So I think that a lot of our secular institutions today, including science, which is from my, in my world, and including healthcare, which is your world, they've become unmoored from the very, the, the very ethics that they need the most. We need that Christian animus. We need that love. We are a holy people and we need to bring that holiness into to all of our endeavors. So I just want to end here with a quote from 1 Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And for me, this love is God. And I can know quantum mechanics and I can pull molecules apart. But if I do not have love, it means nothing. It is sound and fury signifying nothing. And so um, I want to leave you with that. And I'm very happy to take any questions that you have. And I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit over time. But thank you so much for, for sharing this time with me and for listening to me. Thank you very much, Megan. I can't stop smiling here. I'll keep my eyes open. So if people want to ask questions, you can either ask it in the Q&A on the bottom or in the chat, um, while people are forming those, I just want to uh, begin by thanking you. I couldn't stop smiling throughout the presentation. And I know if our ethicist was here, she wasn't able to make it today, but I'll show her the recording of this. Uh, she'd be smiling too, because I think she's very much of the same mind. Uh, I was glad you mentioned Hildegard. She was, uh, I had one of her albums years ago. So <laughs> I'll have to go back and see if I can dig up that CD. But uh, it was really great hearing about some of your story and seeing your your grandpa Bernard there, good, good man, uh, building Bethlehem everywhere. Uh, and for sharing some of your story about um, 
you know, I guess what, what would be termed as, as a wrestling with your faith in terms of growing in your faith and then, you know, sort of having to be almost an apologist and, and, and figuring out how it fits in with science. I really appreciated that. Um, I've been, I've been wrestling through a book myself by Brian, Brian Green recently here, and he uses some of the same phrases. So I mean, I'm, I'm getting really excited about the work. I love the work that you're doing. I just think it would be so interesting to have a whole presentation on that. But uh, the one line that stood out for me uh, was that idea, and I think it was the John Paul II, was that we are asked to be one, not to become each other. Um, because again, that, that sounds like a theological uh, statement, but it, it, you know, in some ways, uh, maybe that's also something that could fit into physics as well, space time. But at any rate, um, it was interesting. Again, some of the history and the points you brought out about St. Basil in the fourth century hospital. I, I love how you drew it together and, and in such a personal way. So I really appreciate that. I'm just turning over here. Oh, and there's Mary. She said she actually was here and she is smiling. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Mary Heilman is smiling. So that's good to hear. Um, Good. Okay, so I'm just going to keep it. a lot of people just saying thank you. That was amazing. Uh, amazing. We're all smiling. Thank you so much. Um, if there are no questions, I'm going to keep my eyes open here for another second or two. Um, but again, I just want to thank you for being part of this day. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, for those of you who either wanted to see parts of this again or to share it with somebody else, it is being recorded. We will put it up on our website. Um, probably in the next, if not tomorrow, it'll be early next week. And you can take a peek at it from, from there. Um, but otherwise, I'm just seeing again, thank you, Megan, wonderful presentation. Um, a lot of people sharing some of what they, they heard, ethics and science, all hospitals exist because of Christianity, Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. Thank you for pulling this all together. Uh, okay, here's a question. Um, Megan, do you feel like there has been any shift from your time as an undergrad to now and how students slash academics are understanding the role of faith in the world. I'm finding in healthcare as more space is made for other cultures and faith traditions, there is some movement towards welcoming other ways of knowing. Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, from my personal experience, what I've found is, to be honest, like to be frank, what I've found is there is a welcoming for other ways of knowing as long as it's they're not Catholic ways of knowing. Like there is sort of this shift to embracing yoga, embracing mindfulness, embracing even things like astrology and sort of healing crystals are now coming back into the, the mix. Um, but there is still this, this kind of disdain for Christianity. I mean, specifically Catholicism, but Christianity in the sense that I almost feel like people are trying to rebel against their parents. Like as a culture, as a society, we sort of are trying to cast off the shackles of our mom and dad. Like that's not cool. Christianity is not cool. Cause that's what it was. You know, these Eastern religions, these are really cool. And of course there are beautiful truths in Eastern religions. Um, and there's a lot of overlap with Catholicism and Christianity, but I feel like I haven't experienced in the academic climate any welcoming, basically. I mean, yeah, I'm thinking now of an experience I had at a conference. I mean, it was 10 years ago now, so it was a while ago, but this researcher just at this poster session totally ripping apart Christianity and and saying, oh, well, we've all, we've disproven all this. It's just, it's just a repackaging of the 10 feet of Hercules, isn't it? That's what Jesus does. Jesus is just Hercules. And he was just so rude and so disdainful in a way that like, I just can't imagine at a similar conference, somebody saying the same sorts of things about Islam. Cause I think there is, and this is a beautiful thing. There's a lot more tolerance for, for those communities. Um, but I, in the academic world, you still get a lot of vitriol. And I think it's because we've inherited a Judeo-Christian worldview. So we, we kind of can, we can kind of hate on it in the way that you rebel against your parents. I don't know, maybe I'm kind of rambling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking uh, there's the book, I, I, I don't know if I've got the author right, Thomas Harper who wrote The Pagan Christ. And that's what he was trying to do in there was kind of conflating all of the, these different, you know, religious beliefs across the world. And then saying they're just they're basically imitations of each other, and it's 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 an interesting read, but it's almost the borderline Da Vinci Code. There's a question here, um, uh, Russ. Did you find uh, Megan? Did you find you had to defend 
uh, your beliefs and discussion with your fellow students? Do you find secular, secularism in the academic world? I'll add that piece to, to be quite aggressive. Yes. So, it can't, well, I guess two, two points there. Yes, I had to defend it to my fellow students. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, actually some of my best friends out of Oxford were militant atheists. And we had lots of really fruitful discussions, it actually helped me grow in my faith so much. I remember spending long hours, you know, till the wee small hours of the morning in the garden, like talking with my friend Vinesh about Christianity and God and trying to defend it and having to think of new ways to present it. And, you know, having to come to these realizations myself, a lot of times, um, if you grow up in a community where certain things and certain dogmas aren't questioned, then you don't really develop yourself the rationale behind them. And so it was a really great experience, a real privilege going to Oxford and being so sort of having to be on guard all the time. Um, I was actually, I volunteered with the, the pro-life society at Oxford and that was also just a war zone. It was, you know, we were constantly, our stalls were getting vandalized. We were getting canceled. And it was, um, I was constantly on the defensive, I felt in Oxford. And the other side of the coin is that in some ways, sympathetic people would come out of the cracks because they heard me um, defending the faith. So people who were Christians, but were not comfortable kind of owning that. So one example of this is I went on a trip with a group of Rhodes Scholars to Israel and Palestine. Um, and we happened to be going um, on Triduum weekend and they sent us our itineraries ahead of, ahead of time. And I saw that there was no time to go to mass. And so I, I said, well, I'm gonna need to go to Easter mass or I can't come on the trip. So can you please like make space for this to happen? And they organized a bus for, I thought just for me, and it was super nice um, to go to Easter Sunday mass. And probably about six other people out of the group of 15 came with me to Easter mass, but wouldn't have asked, like wouldn't have kind of made a fuss about it, but were happy to come. And so I felt like so I guess both sides of the coin. Yes, I had to defend it. And I often felt like I was sticking my neck out. But in the process of that, I, I felt other people who were Christian in their, in their sympathies kind of came out of the woodwork, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mary just got back. She said, she, she said she, unfortunately, I thought you'd say that. The optimist part of me hopes that we can sneak in through the back door. Um, luckily for Mary and I, and for many of us, we are out here in the prairies and things are different. <laughs> as we heard from your talk or at least the uh that's from the, the warden yes yeah. <laughs> the different um, world russ, russ was saying i think he and i, think he, I see what he's saying here he, he was asking if scientists often set up straw men and debating uh the value of christianity totally that's the biggest i mean i think the biggest problem here is that they're they're sort of defeating an enemy that doesn't exist like <clears> their <throat> their conception you often hear them talk and we I actually, I saw a really brilliant debate between, I think it was Alistair McGrath, who often spoke at the Forum of Science and Religion that I was talking about, and Richard Dawkins, a super famous atheist. And I think Richard Dawkins went through this huge diatribe and gave a bunch of arguments deconstructing Christianity. And Alistair was just like, I agree with everything you just said. I don't believe in that God either. Like, you don't know the God that I believe in, right? And so, so I think that there's... Um, I think, yeah, there's a real straw man effect happening. And unfortunately, I think it's because of a tendency that's emerged within Catholicism to sort of um, neglect the, the rich intellectual tradition that we have and to sort of impoverish the faith as we pass it on and not acknowledge the, that, there, that it is reasonable. Like it wasn't until I was reading mere Christianity on the plane as you know, a young woman that I, that I realized my faith was reasonable when that is fundamental. Like that's cool. Maybe that's just because I wasn't listening well in cat in catechesis. That might just be because I was not paying attention, but I do think that there's this effect. And one of the, the bishops that I love, Bishop Robert Barron, who produces a lot of content and speaks a lot about this, there's sort of this impoverishment of the faith and what we truly believe. And so a lot of times we don't even know how, how, how sensible it is and how reasonable it is and how, deeply brilliant it is and so that lead that bleeds into the secularists sort of doing these straw man things because a lot of times catholics don't even know that we don't believe in this sort of santa figure in the sky and that we can believe in evolution and that so there's a lot of there's a lot of straw manning that happens and i unfortunately think i can understand where it comes from because i think that even a lot of christians don't realize 
the, the, the profundity of our notion of God. Beautiful, thank you. There was a, a, a fellow at Newman, Father Don McDonald, that now, to the theology of God classroom, he said uh, very much the same thing, this idea of, you know, tell me about this God you don't believe in. I probably don't believe in him either. Um, yeah. And it was that sense of, of, you know, when you see shows like The Simpsons or these sort of liter literally cartoon versions, that it's like we're, we're trying to defend something, but that's not what we, we believe. He, he, said, he said, most of what we say about God is just as wrong as it is right. You know, God is love. Yes, that's true. But we're also, we have a misunderstanding of what we even mean by love. So, um, right. Yeah. What is that? No, no, no. Anti that what is, there's a name for that anti antifatic theology or something. Oh, well, now you got remember. me thinking about anti pasto. Now I'm going to go have a snack. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for everybody who's, who's held on here. Thank you very much, Megan, for your time. This was beautiful. It was great seeing you here. Um, thanks, everybody, for popping in. We will see, hopefully, many of you tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m. for our next uh, presentation with uh, Gordon Self, and then at 2 p.m. in the afternoon with our recent addition, uh, Michelle O'Rourke. So take care, everybody. Thank you again, Megan. Blessings Thank on your you. day, folks. Take care. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.